Hey everybody, Dr. B here, and I'm going to talk to you about module 12. Uh, before we get into it, we are going to take a look at my t-shirt for the day. It says, you matter. It says, unless, oh, make sure I stay in the frame here. Unless you're multiplied by the speed of light squared, then you energy. All right, well, kind of silly, but it's just a reference to Einstein's equation E equals MC squared. Anyway, moving on, let's go to uh, the PowerPoint. Here we go. So the topic is torque. And specifically, we're only going to look at equilibrium cases. Um, certainly, it's fun to study dynamic cases as well, where the angular velocity is changing, uh, but we won't be doing that. Uh, here's a fun picture of a cool balancing thing. And for this to be balanced, it means the net force has to be zero and also the net torque has to be zero. And basically what it means is the center of gravity is over top of the support. And that's what makes it not tip over because if the center of gravity was a little to the right, then it would have a clockwise torque and it would be tipping this way. Or if the center of gravity was a little bit over this way, it would have uh, a little bit of torque. This would be pulling down here, creating uh, counterclockwise torque, and it would be tipping over this way. All right, well, that's what we're going to be studying. Things to know. Torque has units of Newton meters, and force has units of Newtons. Okay, and we do call it a Newton meter when it comes to torque, not a joule. I know. We learned in Chapter 7, work and energy. If you have a Newton meter, it's a joule. So that was when, like, thinking about the work definition, uh, the force, and the displacement are, are parallel to each other. Um, and then that becomes a joule here. The, the force and the displacement are perpendicular to each other, or not displacement, but the, the lever arm, the force and the lever arm are perpendicular to each other. So it's like a Newton and a perpendicular meter. And that's not equal to a joule. Anyway, I'm not gonna take off points for that, but it is not proper to say that torque has units of joules. So don't do that if you can help it. All right, but anyway, main point is torque and force don't have the same units. Don't get them mixed up. Also, keep in mind that you cannot add things with different units. So if you write your units down and then you see yourself starting to add things together that have different units, stop. Figure out what you're doing wrong. This is the number one thing that people do wrong in this unit. So don't do it. Don't get those confused. People start adding up forces and then they mix in a torque, or they start adding up torques and they add in a force. You can't do that. We can sum the forces. F equals MA, we've been doing that lots of times. And we're gonna learn in this chapter, we can sum the torques. Yeah, that's great. We just can't mix and match. All right. And it does say the equations won't ask you to. If you just do what the equation says, you won't have that problem. But like I said, it's a common thing that goes wrong. That's why I'm warning you about it. All right, torque is equal to F times R times sine of theta. Okay, that's different than the definition for work. Go ahead and find this equation on your equation sheet. Find the work equation. You'll see they look kind of similar, but they're definitely different. All right, so in the packet, you are asked to do a door experiment or an experiment with a door. Um, I, Highly encourage you to do it yourself and feel it. Feel what it feels like when you're pushing um, in different places, in different directions, and so on. But basically, this is a top view of a door. And so you can see the doorknob. We don't normally look at doors from the top, I know. But, but you can imagine. Here's the hinge. There's the doorknob. So this is where people would normally push to open the door, somewhere around here. And so the, the torque created would be this force times this distance. So the distance from where the force is applied to our axis of rotation, and then times the sine of the angle. In this case, the angle between the R vector and the F vector is 90 degrees. It won't always be 90 degrees. Probably like, I don't know, three fourths of the time you're gonna have angles of 90 degrees, but don't get uh, complacent and just think it's always 90 degrees. All right, if we applied the force here, you can see the R value is this long. It's teeny tiny. It's not zero, 
because this goes up. It's not right at where the pin is. It's over a little tiny bit. Um, but you can imagine you're going to get very little torque this way. Try it. Try to open the door by pushing right there. Okay, unlatch it first, but then try to get it to swing the rest of the way by pushing really close to the hinge. Super hard to do. All right, conditions for equilibrium. We already know the condition that the net force in the x direction equals has to be zero for it to be in equilibrium, and the net force in the y direction has to be zero for it to be in equilibrium. If we look at this case, this is for a hockey stick that's laying down on the ice. Now, you don't normally lay your stick down, I know, but just imagine somebody's laid their hockey stick on the ice, and then we're looking at a top view. We're looking down at it. If someone were to push here with a certain amount of force and here in the other direction with the same amount of force, so this could be like 10 newtons and 10 newtons, the net force would be zero, okay? 10 newtons to the right, 10 newtons to the left, the net force would be zero. However, it would not be in equilibrium because it would start to rotate and it would be rotating at an increasing speed. So that's not equilibrium. So there's one more condition for equilibrium, which is that the net torque has to be zero. All right, now more to get you used to this idea of torque. Here we have a balance beam or like a seesaw. Basically it's just a board. And this board is uh, four meters long and it's balanced right here on this triangle. Okay, and you think of it like a seesaw if you've ever had the chance to play on one of those. I know they're not as popular as they once were on playgrounds. All right, so there's our definition for torque. That equation's on your equation sheet. If we put a five kilogram mass there and let's make the center the axis of rotation and we can abbreviate it as AOR, saves a little bit of time. You could save even more time by not writing it, but don't do that. You're not going to get credit if you don't mark your axis of rotation. It makes your solution harder to follow, and I require it. Okay, so don't leave it off. You can abbreviate it, but don't leave it out. The R is measured from the axis of rotation, which we're going to find out later on that you can pick wherever you want to be the axis of rotation because we're only doing equilibrium problems. So none of our systems are actually rotating. And if it's not rotating, there is no real axis of rotation because it's not rotating. And therefore, it's just as valid to pick anywhere as, as anywhere as it's just as valid to pick one place as another place. That's a better way to say it. All right. But in this case, our axis of rotation is right here, which is right where it would rotate if it were to rotate, but it's not going to. So we could have picked somewhere else. All right. So the uh, R goes from here to here. We label it that way. Um, a lot of times students don't draw in the R. It makes it easier to figure out what the R is and the angle. Um, here's the force. This is caused by the weight. You can see there's a 90 degree angle there. And so the torque created by this is five times 9.8. That is the weight. It's 49 Newtons. This is the, <laughs> pardon me, this is the R value and then sine of 90. Again, the R makes an angle of 90 degrees with the F vector. All right, and I already talked about that. Here is another force, could be a rope attached to the end of the beam or somebody just pull, pulling on it for some reason at a weird angle. Regardless, we can figure out the torque from that, mark our axis of rotation, it's the same R, Everything's the same, except that it's an angle of 40 degrees now. And so the torque is going to be less. Okay. Um, the torque is less than in the last slide for two reasons. One is that the force is different, um, but the angle is different too. But even if we use 49 Newtons here, it's not going to give us the same torque as before. Let's try it. 49 times 2 times sine of 40. All right, and that gives us 63 Newton, I'm sorry, 63 Newton meters, or 63.0 Newton meters, really. Um, and we compare that to previously for a 49 Newton force, which is what this is, we had 98 Newton meters. So it went down from 98 Newton meters to 63 Newton meters just by changing the angle. And like I said, of course, this one is actually a different size force too. 
right? And that brings me to another point is that sometimes you're going to be given the, the force. You might even be given the weight of an object. And other times you're going to be given the mass. Like here, you were given the mass and you have to figure out the weight, which is not hard, but you just have to remember to do it. On the other hand, if they told you this had a weight of 49 newtons and then you multiply it by 9.8, well, then you get a ridiculous unit and you get a wrong answer. So just know the difference between mass and weight, which hopefully you do by now. But if not, it's not too late to learn. All right. Determining if a torque is positive or negative. All right. Now you should be able to see the paper that I'm working with. So here we have another seesaw. And what I'm showing you is that at this point here where it's supported, the, the place where it's resting on this triangle, we actually replace that. If I could, I would, I would erase it. And I would replace it with the normal force. OK, it's a free body diagram. And so we don't draw in the other objects. OK, so the other object gets replaced by the force that that object creates. And then this is a whole different scenario in terms of all these other forces, F1, two, three, and four acting. Um, I'll also point out that this object, this board, has weight. And the weight acts at the center of gravity of the object. Now, most objects that we deal with are uniform, and their center of gravity is just at their middle. But if it's something that's non-uniform, then the center of gravity is not going to be at the middle. For example, your leg. If you sit on the edge of your chair and try to hold your leg out perfectly straight, I know this is my arm, but my leg doesn't go up this high. Anyway. If you, uh, if you do that, then after a while, it's going to be hard to do that because your, your leg is pulling down, uh, the, the earth really is pulling down on your leg, that's the leg's weight, and that's creating torque, and you have to, your muscles have to counteract that to keep it in place. But anyway, main point really was that the center of gravity of your leg is not in the center. It's not halfway down your leg because your thigh is thicker than your ankle. And so the center of gravity is closer up to your uh, hip than it is to your foot because it's not a uniform object, all right? So if it's not a uniform object, you have to be told what the center of gravity is or given some way to be able to calculate it. It could be the unknown thing that you're trying to calculate. All right, but enough about that. Let's come back to this and determining if torque is positive or negative. Well, first things first, you have to decide which way is positive and which way is negative. We can't use up or down or left or right to be a positive direction for torque because torque causes things to rotate. And even though we're, we're doing all equilibrium cases, we still can figure out what direction the torque is from each force relative to what we pick as the positive direction. Uh, for all of the examples that I do, all the examples in the video, in the note packet, et cetera, we always pick the positive direction to be counterclockwise. And your book does that as well. So we're just being consistent with your book. Now, you could pick whatever you want for a given problem, as long as you're consistent for the whole problem. All right, so counterclockwise is picked to be positive. And for this example, we're picking the center of gravity to be the center of the board, okay? And so what I do then is I use what I call the, the pencil method, or in this case, the pen method, Although it looks like my pen's not long enough. So I'm going to use a ruler instead. Uh, typically, I don't draw free body diagrams that are um, eight and a half inches long. So I don't, I can use my pen or my pencil typically. But on this one, it's so long, I'm going to use a ruler. But you can imagine using a, a pencil here instead. Although it's, it's a little hard to see the arrows. All right, so for each one, we can figure out what direction it's acting. So F, so first of all, I have to hold it at the axis of rotation, which I picked to be the center. So I hold it there, and then I apply the force in the direction that it says. So F2 is creating a torque that way. So that's creating a clockwise torque, which is in the negative direction. Okay, so that's creating a negative torque. F1 is downward. And so that's creating a positive torque. Fn, what do you see? You don't see it. 
moving at all, right? So no torque. Mg, same thing. I guess I'm gonna write a verb in here. There we go. F3 is downward. F1 was downward. But look, F3 creates negative torque. All right, F1 was downward, F3 was downward, but one creates positive torque, one creates negative torque. That's why it's really important to have a good system for being able to figure out what kind of torque they create. Like I said, this pencil or pen method works here. I'll just do it with a pen so you can see. I hold it at the axis of rotation. I push in the direction and you can see it twisting clockwise, which is the negative direction. Or over here, it's twisting counterclockwise, which is a positive direction. And then similarly, this one over here, positive torque created. All right. But what I said was that you can pick anywhere you want to be the axis of rotation because they are we're doing equilibrium cases. And so let's look at this same scenario, except when the left end of the beam is chosen to be the axis of rotation. I'll grab my ruler here. I'll use the pen at first. We look, F1 creates clockwise rotation. That's positive torque. Uh, no, that's negative torque, sorry. Counterclockwise is the positive direction. Sorry about that. And F2 is, shoot, I just dropped it again. All right, F2 is creating positive torque. Fn, positive, Mg negative f3 this is where i need my this is where i need my ruler f3 is creating negative torque and f4 is creating positive torque okay and it's just abbreviating here but look f1 creates negative torque with respect to this axis of rotation but positive torque with respect to this axis of rotation F3 is negative either way. It's creating negative torque, I should say, either way. Um, the normal force and the weight created no torque relative to the center, but they create positive and negative torque, respectively, when you look at the uh, torque created with respect to this end. So you've got to be able to commit to an axis of rotation and then figure out what the torque is relative to that axis of rotation. And then if you're asked to change, you need to be able to change. All right, so that, here's that. And now we move on to our conditions for equilibrium. And there, your book presents it as two, I like to think of it as two, sorry, three conditions for equilibrium. One is that the summation of the torque is equal to zero. And the summation of forces in the x direction is equal to zero, and the summation of forces in the y direction is equal to zero. Okay, so a few things. Greek letter sigma means summation of. This is the Greek letter tau, which is what we use to stand for torque. So tau is torque. T, capital T, remember what that stands for? Tension. And then lowercase t is time. Now you won't see time in any of these problems in module 12, but you will see both tau and capital T. And if you don't differentiate between them, you're gonna cause problems for yourself, all right? So it doesn't matter how pretty it is, your tau, you just need to be able to draw something that you can tell apart from capital T. And then you need to know the difference. Okay, so symbolically, be able to draw two different symbols and then use them properly. Okay, this is torque, has units of Newton meters. T is tension, which is a force, has units of Newtons. 
of course, time has units of seconds, but like I said, that won't be showing up in this chapter. All right, so three conditions for equilibrium, one, two, three, or you can say it's two conditions. You just say, overall, the net force is zero. That means in all directions, X, Y, and even the Z direction, if you wanted. Um, and then the torque is zero is the other condition. Uh, I kind of like to think of it as three, the three equations, you could have as many as three unknowns. All right, and I can't say it enough times, torque is torque, force is force, don't mix and match, they have different units, you can't add them together anyway, doesn't make sense mathematically, so don't do it. All right, now, these are covered, these free body diagrams are covered in video 12.06, so I'm not gonna go through them all again in this video. I just wanted to point out some things to uh, hopefully put you on the right track. First of all, when you see a connection point, okay, when you see a connection point where something is attached, there's some kind of hinge or flange, or it could just be they, they made a hole in the wall and they jammed this into it. Maybe they put some cement around it to hold it in place. Whenever that's happening, there's going to be a force in the x direction and in the y direction at that location. So at that location, there or uh, I guess I should say there could be, um, which is part of what you're going to look at in here. At attachment point. And really, I guess we should say there's a force from the thing, the beam is attached to on the beam at an unknown angle. Okay, so R at some angle theta. Now it's not necessarily in the first quadrant like I drew it there. And R is made up of Rx and Ry. My book might call it something different. Um, you might call it something different. The videos uh, for this chapter, some of the instructors may have chosen something a little bit different, but typically I use Rx and Ry. I think of it as the, the, the reaction force that's happening there. And so when we go to draw the free body diagram for this one, like I said, I'm not gonna do all of them. There's tension, the beam has weight, and then there could be an Rx and an Ry. So Rx, let's see, which direction is Rx in? Is Rx to the right or to the left? If we drew it to the right, then we would have this, which has a rightward component, and this, which is rightward, and then nothing that's downward. So we can't have this be to the right, it must be to the left. We can't just have this to the right, this to the right, and then nothing to the left. It can't be in equilibrium if there's no forces to the left, but there are forces to the right. Notice that there's not a normal force because this beam is not sitting on the ground. It's not sitting on a support, right? It's touching here and that's causing Ry, which is probably up. Um, it takes a little more thought to figure out that that has to be up, but it's most likely up. And I think most of you would draw it that way. Uh, but there are some cases where R sub Y is in a direction that's surprising to you. If you draw it the wrong way and then you solve for it and you get a negative value, it just means you drew it in the wrong direction. Um, all right. Now, there's not always an RX and an RY. And you'll see in this one, there's weight, there's tension, there's an RY. This is where it attaches here. So there's an Ry, and then what direction should Rx be? Well, if we drew it to the right, if we drew Rx to the right, that would mean there's a rightward force, but no leftward forces anywhere. And if we drew Ry to the, or sorry, Rx to the left, that would mean we'd have a leftward force and no rightward forces anywhere. So it turns out Rx equals zero for this one. Okay, so you got to figure out what Rx and Ry, what direction they are, or they may be zero, so keep that in mind as well. 
So the best way to do it to find r and the angle is to find what rx and ry are separately, solve for them, then you can take rx, whichever way it happens to be. Like in this case, rx is going to be to the left, ry is upward. Okay, that's for our top scenario. And then we're going to find r this way, and that'll be our angle. Okay, so it's a vector diagram. Okay, forces are vectors, so we draw them as we represent them as arrows, not lines. So over, up, we put the two components head to tail. The head of the x component goes next to the tail of the y component, or vice versa. Okay, we could draw it this way, draw the y component first, and then draw the x component. And then we draw the R from the beginning of the first one, whichever one we drew first, to the head of the last one, the second one. And then this angle theta would be equal to this angle theta. Okay, but this angle would be different than this angle or this angle. So in other words, if this was 30, this would be 30. And then this would be 60, that would be 60. Anyway, that's just a review about vectors. Again, when you have an attachment point, look for what the R, Y, and R, X are. And then once you solve for R, Y, and R, X, you can put them together to get what R and theta are. Okay. If you have something that's not attached, but just resting, right? then you're going to have Fn and Fs. Okay, you have a normal force, which is going to be perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so the wall is vertical. So you're going to have a horizontal Fn. Drew a pretty bad looking horizontal line, so I tried to make it look more horizontal there. That's why it's so thick and ugly right now. And then the static friction is going to be what direction? Parallel to the surface. And let's see, the ladder wants to slide down the wall. I mean, it doesn't really want to, but that's the tendency is you're afraid it's going to slip down the wall. And static friction is what's keeping it from sliding down the wall. Okay. So we still have a vertical and a, sorry, yeah, vertical and a horizontal force, but they're not Rx and Ry because it's not attached. Okay. And these are forces we've already used in the past, and they're just as valid here as any other time that we've used them. This is not a complete free body diagram. Again, watch video 12.06 for that complete free body diagram. All right, that gives you a start. Um, good luck to you. And just ask me if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to meet with you or answer questions by email.